You got White Zombie as your walk-up, Joshua. What do you think? Yeah? It's great. Well, what kind of music did young Joshua Grinnell in Baltimore uh, listen to when, when you were growing up? I'm going to guess a lot of prog rock, like, yes, Genesis, Vandergraaff, Generator. No? No. No? Uh, I was definitely dark, and I liked Suzy Sue a lot. You grew up golf? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Of course, Peaches. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I mean, if you grow up a young Peaches Christ, Robert Smith is a great, you know, role model. I mean, he made it cool for, you know, guys to wear makeup. Yeah, that's a good dude. And I loved Kiss. I liked a lot of bands where men wore makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like, um, let's let me try to just name off some bands here. Tell me, Depeche Mode. Love Depeche Mode. Dead or alive, you spit me right round. Yeah. Yeah, zoo, yes. Yeah, I like I like yes too. Okay, so you did grow up in Baltimore. Uh, um, well, I grew up in Maryland. Maryland, okay, um, sorry. Outside of Baltimore. But, Harvard um, across? But, but, what's that? No, Annapolis. Oh, okay. And so I'm gonna take, oh, so you were a goth. Also, I know you were making short films and stuff when you were younger, so I'm gonna take it that you were probably a drama kid. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's safe to say you were a drama queen. Yes. <laughs> is it safe to say John Waters is the inspiration? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes is what I'm all for. But uh, so let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, okay. Tell me when, when Peaches. You started making short films as Peaches, right? Yeah. I mean, I was always that kid who, like, you know, I, I was obsessed with horror movies as a kid, and um, I would I would say it was more like weird than queer, you know, um, I didn't know I was gay, like, I was kind of the last to know I was gay, I was like, I love erasure, and, you know, uh, you know like, I want to, you know, and I want to go to the Madonna concert, and, you know, um, and I would direct all the haunted houses in the neighborhood, and I would write scripts and make little horror movies, um, but I was really into that, like way more than anything else. Were you a so, part of like this, like I, I, something that we talk about a lot on the on the radio show, and is this culture of just like kids that would just stand for an hour in the horror section at the V at, oh, the, v, at yeah. the video store, right? So tell me about maybe some of the first movies that got you uh, into horror, because uh, mine were mine are very boring. I was into the Reanimator and Evil Dead Two, which is every in basket case. Yeah. Oh. Is, it, yeah. is, it, is it the same thing, or is it for other? sure? I mean, I was. I remember the the sort of well. I remember actually the video store having um, old like clamshell um, boxes for Herschel Gordon Lewis movies, and my mother wouldn't let me rent them, um, but somehow. Uh, someone was able to get the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And we were really young. And we got Texas Chainsaw Massacre and I think Psycho um, from, the, oh, and uh, The Exorcist. And like, this was, I was really young. Like, so really slow, boring horror movies were your formative. <laughs> but for me, they were, they, they completely changed everything and opened my mind. Yeah. And the other one that we got at an inappropriate, inappropriate Marty young Stafford? age. No, was Pink Flamingos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you realize at the time that this 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 guy? Did you recognize the the surroundings of Pink Flamingos? We did. It was your it was your hometown, yeah, not your hometown, but around there. Yeah, we did. I mean, my relatives, many of my relatives live in Baltimore. We went to Baltimore a lot. So when we saw Pink Flamingos, not only did it create like a big controversy because our friend's mother caught us watching it, and then she watched it, and the um, video store was called Mom's Video, and, uh, and it was on Ken Island, which is really kind kind of like, uh, you know Kathy Bates' accent in American Horror Story? Oh yeah. This is where it comes from. Can you I? talk in that accent a little bit? No. <laughs> no, I cannot. Oh my god. What do, you, what do you think of American Horror Story, by the way? I, here's what I think. Before you say anything, let me say what I think. Okay. I think that the gore is really good. I love the gore in it. I just, I want a little more from it. I want a little more substance. And then it goes goes into the, the song, the sing-songy stuff. I don't know. That doesn't speak to me so much. Um, what do you think? Of, because it's cool that horror is getting to mainstream moms and stuff right now, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I really liked Asylum. Um, I think it tapped into all of, I mean, I built a whole career on being sacrilegious, so Asylum uh, appealed to me for a lot of reasons, but I also thought it was like kind of relentless and uh, exciting. And I felt like the other seasons, in a lot of ways, fall apart. Like I didn't finish watching Freak Show because I got bored. And it's 
Kind of like, I think, you know, the worst crime. You you fucking dodged a bullet on that one, dude. Yeah. It ended up terrible. We got to, like, Neil Patrick Harris, and we were like, no. We're out. Yeah. I, I, stuck through, I stuck through the goddamn thing, and it was not... It was, it was like Lost. Lost was like, why did I sit through five years of this? Place? Right. Um, kind of like this radio show. hey <laughs> John, John Waters, really quick. So John Waters was an influence of you in an early age, and yeah. um, uh, did you ever come across like when when did when did Josh and John cross paths? The first time I met John was uh, in college. I went to Penn State and I was studying film, and I was making a movie called Jizz Mopper. And, uh, and I was in the movie in drag. That was when I first did drag, and. Um, Needless to say, the administration at Penn State like hated the movie and put the last in Dusky. Yeah, so Dusky was, I guess, doing his thing, and I was getting all the attention. Um, but I just felt like you know, if we could bring John to Penn State, it would sort of validate this kind of filmmaking, and um, and of course, uh, when we did bring him, you know, all of the the, the faculty and stuff were like, you know rimming him. I mean, they were so excited he was there, you know, and like, all of a sudden I was, you know, kind of like... He was like the, the culture of Baltimore, basically. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and he, I mean, he's, uh, you know, really, obviously, a fantastic, important filmmaker, and this was in the mid-90s, no, yeah, the mid-90s, and, you know, I, I met him, and I was just a huge fan. I remember when the plane landed, and he got off the plane, and it was like a puddle jumper, because it was at uh, State College, Pennsylvania, and my knees started shaking, you know, that feeling of like, cartoony nervousness where it's like, oh my fucking God, my knees are shaking. And I remember him getting into the car and I was in the passenger seat and he couldn't get the seatbelt on. And he was like, what is this seatbelt made for? Karen Carpenter? <laughs> I remember being like, John Waters is like yelling about the seatbelt, you know, and like he was John Waters the whole weekend, you know, and like eating with John Waters, like hanging out with him, taking him out for drinks, like he never stops being John, and it blew me away, and I never, and I didn't see him uh, for, for many years, but it was John who, when I said what I was going to do after graduating, which was either move to LA or moved to New York, and he said, well, what kind of movies do you want to make? And I, I was telling him what I liked, and he was like, you should move to San Francisco, you know, that's where the underground film scene is. You should find the Kuchar brothers. You should learn about the Coquettes. They were this drag troupe who did midnight movies and did shows. Yeah, the Coquettes in San Francisco. And, 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 he, and he said, you know, the Coquettes were these wild, hippie, bohemian drag queens who, you know, tripped balls and put on movie, you know, movie events where they did drag shows before midnight movies. And so when I moved to San Francisco, like, a year later, you know, I really can credit John for putting that seed in my mind, and I was determined, like, I was going to do a movie show as a drag queen, and that's what I ended up doing. That's, uh, a, 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 jo a John made me move to San Francisco, too, put the seed in my mind. It was the HBO show John from Cincinnati that no one watched. <laughs> but I watched that show. I thought, I thought you were using the word John as, like, a male, you know. <laughs> I'm not joking. I thought you were going to see real stuff. Okay, so you moved to San Francisco. Was Peaches a fully formed thing, idea, character by that point? And did you start working at the, the, the famous, it was the Bridge Theater, right? On well, I, I, yeah, I started working for Landmark right away and actually ran Landmark Theaters that, you know, run, at the time ran a lot of independent cinemas in the Bay Area. And um, I was, you know, really young and they hired me to, uh, to run a movie theater they were going to close. Uh, but I didn't know it at the time, but because they were going to close it, it was that down on the peninsula, they let me do a, a kitty matinee series where... <laughs> like like showed, kitty like, cats, like crawling around, you know, like, like going like this? Like little children. And, um, but I showed things like, um, you know, uh, Willy Wonka, and we did like a golden ticket, you know, and the kid got a Ghirardelli tour, you know, this behind the, the scenes. Theater? It was the Belmont, yeah. I actually went to that Willy Wonka. Really? Oh my god! Yes! That's Wow! That's amazing! Wow! Yeah, I dressed up as Willy Wonka. I mean, that's so crazy. And that was like 20 years ago. And, and so Landmark, because it did really well, they said, oh, well, um, what else can you do? And I said, well, I always wanted to do a midnight movie. And so they gave me the bridge, and I ended up like running the Bridge Theater at 23 and, and creating a midnight movie series there mm -hmm. that I hosted as Peaches. Yeah, that uh, changed my life when I moved to San Francisco. I started going to your midnight shows and it just, it, you know, that we didn't have really have anything like that in LA. They had, they had stuff 
that tried to be that in LA, but the, the what you did at the bridge was like very life changing for me. Well, thank you. We broke a lot of laws, and I can't believe we got away with it for as long as we did. Now, Peaches became this thing. Uh, I mean, you were involved with so many influential things, but the, the, the training shack, of course, and all that. Um, what's it called now? What do we call it now? It's well, training shack is pretty much ended. And yeah. There's a new club uh, that Hecklina has called Mother. Mother. So. That's that's the right word. Now, mother. Um, <laughs> you get dancing there. Yeah, you should get dancing there. You should have a dancing <laughs> night at Mother. Right? That's such a good idea. I think that's Very good. perfect fit. Yeah. Uh, now. You wield, I feel like, in like you kind of, I don't know, I, it's hard to put into words, but you know, since RuPaul's Drag Race has uh, come out and made things kind of mainstream, that world that you existed in, and I was an outsider, I mean, I'm an outsider in it, but I like loved going to the shows, you know what I mean? It made me feel, it was just, made me feel real special. People like Sharon Needles have come out, this whole horror thing, but I, I feel like you kind of invented the, the horror and drag thing and put it together. Um, that was a, a, a conscious decision. It was just it's just you, right? I think it was just sort of that thing where I um, just did what I wanted, and so I never really thought about it. And I loved I loved drag. I was introduced to drag by movies like Pink Flamingos and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I always I always saw drag as being midnight movie and cult and hor horrific. How many people here had their like their lives changed with the Rocky Horror Picture Show? They discovered it when you were little, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a formative experience for. Weirdos, I so, feel like. Yeah, I just ne I never really thought about it. Like it wasn't really it wasn't an option for me to kind of try to do um, pretty drag or yes. safe drag or you know family friendly drag. Like I don't understand that at all. So you know I always wanted to be the drag queen carrying a chainsaw or whatever. You know. Hey, uh, okay, real quick, real quick. Let's go through the famous drag movies in Hollywood. Uh, we'll, we'll skip the we'll skip the Jack Lemmon. Uh, Marilyn Monroe one. Kung Fu, thank you, uh, John. Okay, so wait, so wait, no, before that. Yeah, Tu Wong Fu. Good movie or bad movie, Josh? Tired. Tired. Okay. What else is there? That's it. That's the only one. Thank you. Elvis, no, I, Elvis, I, no, King of the Desert. I always liked the, the, the drag stuff where where the, um, the queer person was basically threatening or terrifying. So do? mostly the stuff that gay activists were protesting, I was like, fabulous. Like, I love cruising. Oh, cruising! I love Silence of the Lambs. I love Dress to Kill. We have to ask, hips or um, the lips? I, what's that? The hips or the lips? The hips or the lips. Yeah, what does that mean, Al? It's a cruising. Oh, cruising? Oh, thanks. All right. So anyway, let's move on. Uh, this picture struck me. Um, oh, that's your logo. Sorry, I should have had that up the whole time. <laughs> but this picture of you struck me. I've been seeing these all over San Francisco, and there you are. I'm wearing the same jacket. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a very handsome jacket on you. Other costume. Um, you have two jackets. Therein, therein, therein exists these du this double life. Uh, you are standing here next to a giant picture of yourself on the San Francisco street. Uh, tell me about living that double life. Um, uh, how is it living life as someone famous that maybe people don't know who you are walking down the street? Is that cool or uncool? I think it's cool. I mean, I, I actually really like it because I, I sort of describe it as like a, sort of like a superhero type of celebrity where um, like Peaches is that thing that's on that poster and like a lot of times I'll be walking by that sort of thing and no one would know that it's me standing next to it or whatever or someone's wearing like a Peaches shirt at the gym I always tell this story of this woman who like completely gave me attitude and I was like oh my god you're such a bitch like I was thinking about it and then I looked and she was wearing a Peaches shirt and she was you know talking to me like I was an idiot have you ever heard people talk shit about Peaches Christ yes, in front yes, of you on the bus oh really <laughs> I was sitting right, like right in front of them. I kind of turned around. And I was like, "Really? What's your favorite bus line? Mine is the one California. I think that's a really relaxing bus line." What's your favorite? 
I like the 33. Oh, you're out. Get out of here. Stockton? The Stockton? The one that's security goes, like, from the Richmond all the way up through the hills and through the hate. All right. 23, man. I'm talking about the 33. Oh, I'm, I'm 33. Okay, standing, sorry. Yeah. It's on the stand -in? Beautiful. Oh. Okay, okay. It has a lot more fans than I thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so to LA, Corey. <laughs> if you haven't, there's no, we don't have buses in LA. So Peaches becomes this big, huge thing, as most of you probably know. If you don't know, Peaches is this big, huge phenomenon, and you, you start working at the. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm skipping a couple years, Josh. But I want to talk about. I just was like reacting to the word "huge" over and over. And I'm like, <laughs> huge. I get it. She's big. Um, <laughs> A large lady. You do the. <laughs> that's not what I mean. I mean a big phenomenon. Oh, right. Like the new Eminem song from that uh, from that Jake Gyllenhaal boxing movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I've been to a ton of your shows, and if, if, if you don't know, uh, Joshua as speeches puts on these big elaborate song and dance number drag shows based on these cult movies. And I've been to it, uh, God, I, I can't, I don't, 10, 11, 12, 13 of them. Um, do you mind if I go through a couple of them right no, now? Not at because all. I want to show you guys if you haven't been to them. Uh, okay, this is the Witches of Eastwick right here. Yeah. There's Josh. Uh, that was, uh, well, for us, uh, it was the Witches of East Bay. Right, thank you. Yeah. Witches of East Bay. <laughs> yeah. Is that Chad Michaels right there? It's Chad Michaels who played Cher. Oh. Uh, Her so, Cher is... Yeah, well, she's like the foremost, yeah. like the, the best Cher impersonator in the that's world. That's famous actor Thomas Decker, right? Yeah, that's oh Thomas, is Jack Nicholson, and uh, Coco Peru is Susan Sarandon, yeah. Oh, man, uh, uh, beautiful. Um, if you have any, any, any funny stories about these, let me know. Oh, do I have to even say what's what was Dorothy's drag name? Was Dorothy have a drag name? No. Uh, Peachy. Oh, Peachy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Trannibal Lecter. Yeah. <laughs> that was the Silence of the Trans. Yeah. I love. I this was the high, one of the highlights of my life was going to this show. Yeah. Um, oh, this is Showgirls. Show. So I I think uh, I've had arguments before. I think that Josh, you are partly responsible for the perception that Showgirls has in people's mind, movie fans' minds now, which is like this unsung genius thing. Um, <laughs> you, you started doing the Showgirls thing every year, but do you, do you remember, did you go see Showgirls when it first came out? I did. I had to, I was a women's studies minor at Penn State, and, um, and I had to cross a picket line of my fellow students who were like, shame, shame, and I was like, whatever, it's really good. <laughs> And I remember watching it and thinking like, oh my god, it's amazing. So, um, Jessie Spano from Saved by the Bell, she just... Elizabeth Berkeley. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Al. She just came out and, uh, she just came out and she like, finally, she came out to a showing of it, right? She did. She, she has finally embraced Showgirls 20 oh, years later. This is the, this is actually the 20th anniversary of Showgirls yeah, this year. Right. Yeah. Are you gonna, are you gonna do something for it? For the 20th anniversary? So, this for us is our, so, I do think... I don't take credit for very much, but I will take credit for the fact that Showgirls, in, in a lot of ways, has become this cult movie because in 1998, we screened it as a midnight movie. It came out in 96, you know? That's right. So, we, um, or 95, yeah, so we were really early, and I remember when we were booking it, and through the bookers and MGM, they were like, you know, because it was only three years old, you know? They were like, what are you talking about? You want to book it at midnight? And I you said, that's what we want to book. And I, and I really felt like it was immediately a midnight movie. And so it's the only film that I've shown every single year. And so this summer will be my 18th annual screening of it. So is that going to be the Castro? It's going to be at the Castro. And for 18 years, we have offered free lap dances with every large popcorn. I've got one. Yeah, yeah, I've you seen Shelby Gellin yeah. before. So because we're at the Castro now, and we call it Night of a Thousand Showgirls, and we typically sell out, I have to book 100 lap dancers. We already have something like 80-something signed up, so... Josh, I have so many questions for you, I'd like to keep going, but I okay. just, it sucks. Uh, this is The Craft, of course. Yeah. This was one of the great movies of our time. Oh, this is you with the wiener, wiener dog herself. Yeah, Look at me and Heather Matarazzo. She is so great in Roseanne, by the way. Yes. I've been watching those later Roseanne episodes. Uh, welcome to the dollhouse, if you guys don't know. Purple Rain. Purple Rain. <laughs> yeah. How pretty is Josh, by the way? That's not the best picture. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, you met Pam Greer herself, yeah. the goddess. Well, how, was Pam Greer cool? Yeah, I mean, 
mean, like, uh, the, one of the most surreal parts of my uh, career has been, like, I'm basically a fan, a big nerd who grew up loving all these movies and these people, and now sometimes I get to work with some of them, and, like, Pam Greer, my God, I mean, like, it was surreal, like, doing a show with her. That's how I feel right now with you on stage. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Barry Boswick, Brad, from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. He, he really... Megaforce. He really... <laughs> Megaforce. He never really, uh, I mean, he would show up at conventions, but he never really got in depth about Rocky Horror until this night. I remember yeah, I was listen, there. Well, that was very strange because, so, I was doing the show with Barry Bostwick, and I didn't meet him. Usually I meet the people before we do the show, like a day before, but he didn't want to meet me. And I remember being like, oh, that's kind of un unfortunate. And, um, and so we met backstage. And he said to me, I said, oh, are you going to watch the show? I'll bring you from, um, from in the house. You know, why don't you watch from the back and we'll bring you up. And he said, no, 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 can I use your dressing room? I'm just going to hang out in there while you're doing the show. And then I'll just come out when it's time for me to do the interview. And I was really bummed. I thought, oh, this fucking sucks. Like, this interview is going to go nowhere and he's not into it. And why is he even here? And I was just so bummed because we had, like, put on this whole song and dance. And I had all these performers there and different shadow casts. And... And he went into my dressing room and shut the door, and I was like, this sucks. I go out on stage, I'm doing the show. What I don't know is that he's getting into Rocky drag for the first time since he made the movie. So he actually was in my dressing room with a little team who came in. They put the fishnets on him, they put everything on him. So when he walked out on stage in the high heels and the feather boa, I, and people thought I was faking it. No, I was really shocked. Like, it took my breath away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah, this is bullshit. You're not real. Uh, <laughs> Cloris Leachman, of course. She's supposed to be crazy. Cloris Leachman took my fucking wig off on stage. What an asshole. A dickhead. Uh, Josh. She did that. You. <laughs> but she had just taken the turban off a cab driver and almost caused an accident. So. And then she drew an image of Mohammed. I'm not, I'm not even lying. Cloris Leachman is crazy. I mean, I love her and I love doing the show. And she actually had the, you know, she had the, the manners to be like, can I take your wig off your head? And I said, yeah, sure. I have um, a million questions for you, Josh. But I don't, I'm not, I don't mean this bad, but maybe you're bigger than the Castro Theater soon. What's next? What are you doing? What's, what's the plan? Where does it go from here? I don't know that, like, I want to move from the Castro Theater anytime soon because I feel like, you know, San Francisco is so special to us and, like, you know, what, what better theater can we be in? So what we've started doing is just adding shows. So now, nice. now for a lot of the shows, we'll actually add a matinee show. There's nothing stranger than doing full drag and doing a full drag show at 3 p.m. <laughs> 